too, the workers were able to fill a tree. Um, there are Bay County pine trees all over the area. And somehow they decorated it, and somebody placed presents under the tree. Remember now, the Astor family, at one point in America, early American history, was probably the wealthiest family in the country. And they had presents under this makeshift tree. The little boy came out of his room the next morning in the unfinished Royal Palm Hotel. He was wearing a sailor suit, and Santa Claus had arrived. There were his presents. So he was thrilled to death. The hotel opened in the middle of January 1897, a tremendous amount of hoopla surrounding the hotel itself. Again, it was only seasonal, and we're going to come back to the theme of workers shortly. Uh, but as the years went on, and Miami grew, and tourism grew, and it grew tremendously. So that by the mid-1920s, this was one of the most famous tourist resorts on the East Coast of the United States. And as the years went on, the hotel's opening periods uh, just extended to April 1 on one side, and sometime around Thanksgiving on the, the back end of it. So, Miami is underway. It's an instant city. It goes from nine people to an incorporated city on July 28, 1896. They chose an Irish Catholic for mayor, an overwhelmingly Protestant town. How did that happen? Well, Henry Flagler's top lieutenant at the time down here was a, a very saintly man who was born in Nova Scotia, Joseph A. McDonald, and his son-in-law, John Riley, was elected, but really, I think, in many ways, anointed as president, as mayor of Miami. And um, a lot of people believe that this was indeed a railroad town. It was really dominated by the flag of people, and it was. And so for those early years then, it grew very quickly, kind of tied itself around tourism. It was seasonal. Um, that begins to change, though, as the 20th century unfolds. And one of the things I think that helps it change is the drainage of the Everglades. Uh, draining the Everglades, they used the term reclamation, was a dream that a lot of people had had champions of drainage going back to at least the 1840s. And it became a reality on the part of the state of Florida in 1906. And so you begin to drain the Everglades. The idea was we would create all this new, very, very, very rich farmland. And uh, so we could have all these crops and what have you. But as it's turned out, of course, the a majority of the populations of Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County live in what was Everglades Swampland. So it's become actually a huge suburban area with millions of people living there. But that just boosted real estate as another major enterprise in the Miami area. And those two things, tourism and real estate, come together by the mid-20s to create a huge boom that really transformed this area in what had been a young frontier town with the aberration of a great hotel into what I think was a, an emerging metropolitan area by 1925. And as with all booms, it had a crash. And it crashed in 1926. And then it got hit hard by a hurricane uh, in September, September 17, 18, 1926, which really was the final nail in the coffin of this whole thing. And so Miami really slipped into its own economic depression before the rest of the nation. It was really mired in the depression. We had one solvent bank in downtown, and perhaps that was the only solvent bank in the whole area. And that was the first national bank today, as well as Fargo. Everything else had gone down. Unemployment was as it was in the rest of the nation. It was over in the 20s, 20%. Uh, nationally in 1933, it was 25%. And all the things that came with that, foreclosures and hopelessness and what have you. But the area also, I think, was able to lift itself out of the Great Depression earlier than other areas, in part because of tourism. And probably because during the New Deal, which was in many ways very supportive of labor organizing, you begin to see some of the biggest industries in the country, like steel manufacturing, auto manufacturing, by the end of the 30s, organizing. And what happened with that was that some of these workers were getting these vacation packages. And they started coming down to Miami Beach. And lo and behold, the great art deco hotels we know today, which were not considered great at that time, were built. Uh, buildings using that, what we call streamlined modern art deco style, buildings of that style between the hotels and the apartments would number well over a thousand by the time World War II began at the end of, or the early part of December of 1941. And so you can see then the transformation of Miami Beach into a huge tourist spec at the time. The war comes, and I'm going to come back to this thing very shortly, and we were a huge military training center. And this also is part of the theme that's inside uh, the exhibition room now, work. 
Uh, we had almost every branch of the armed forces here and all the jobs that accompanied that. We'll come back to that shortly. When the war was over, it's very interesting in America, a lot of people believed that the war was just a temporary respite in this terribly depressed economy we had since 1929 nationally, in the case of Greater Miami, 1926. And they believed that once the war was over, all the spending that went on, the military spending, et cetera, for the war, we'd come back into a, another depression. But what happened after the war was all the pent up savings from all the jobs that uh, were available during the war and were taken was used uh, for many people to buy their first home, buy their first car, and what we see is this tremendous spending frenzy that goes on right after the war, all the way through much of the 1950s. The first really bad downturn comes at the end of the 50s economically. And so we were just in a, another stratosphere. Meanwhile, the area grows enormously, and the growth now is primarily suburban. The city of Miami's growing, but the suburbs are growing much faster. The Dade County's population went crazy. On the eve of World War II, the 1940 census found in Miami 174,000 people. It found only around 250,000 people in all of Dade County. In 1962, Dade County reached a million people. In 1995, Dade County reached 2 million people. Today, Dade County is nearing 2.8 million people, or Miami-Dade County. So it's just been this tremendous growth. And you can say almost the same thing for other parts of Southeast Florida. Fort Lauderdale on the eve of World War II counted a little more than 17,000 people. By 1970, it had 150,000 people. Broward County on the eve of World War II had less than 50,000 people. Today, it has 1.8 million people. So the growth is just astronomical. Florida in 1900 was the smallest state in the United States, in the southern, in the American South, with 529,000 people. Today, it has more than 19 million people. So growth through weather, through marketing, through retirement communities has led to this enormous growth of the area. Now what's interesting also is, is that uh, Miami, long before the term multicultural was used, had small pockets of people from all over the place. We had, by the 1960s, around Flagler Street, between roughly around 32nd Avenue and about 47th Avenue, a growing Chinese community. We had a Syrian Lebanese club as far back as the 1930s. We had a Greek church, St. Sophia, the congregation was founded in 1927. And it just goes on and on and on. We had a very small Jewish population to begin with. It grew enormously during the boom in the mid-20s, so that by the beginning of the 1950s, a majority of the people living in Miami Beach were Jewish. It was such a tremendous influx at that time from New York and and even farther away from parts of Europe. So we're on the brink of becoming a multicultural place uh, by the 1950s, before the term was even used. And it goes on. For the first time after World War II, there were direct flights between San Juan and Miami, San Juan and New York. We begin to see in today's Wynwood, which is obviously on the news these last many years, uh, a growing Puerto Rican population. We saw a small Cuban population that grows enormously after Fulgencia Batista illegally takes power in 1952 as the Cuban leader. One historian has estimated that in the 50s, before Castro came to power, Greater Miami had somewhere between 30 and 40,000 Cubans. And it's interesting, in some research I was doing eons ago about something, I came across some clippings of the Miami Girl of Miami News that were referencing in the early 50s the lower part, the western edge of Flagler Street as it reaches the Miami River. So it's downtown Flagler that's running perpendicular to the Miami River. They're referencing that in the early 50s as Little Havana because there was a theater there, the Flagler Theater, where young Fidel Castro had come to shill for his rebel cause in 1955. There was a, a, a little restaurant there, Cuban coffee was served, there were demonstrations down there, what have you. Also today, Shenandoah Riverside, which really comprises the heart of Little Havana, were also welcome a lot of Cubans. So everything was said, I think, for the time that the Castro takeover occurred in 1959, this tremendous influx of Cubans. And there were already a lot of Spanish speakers in the area. And then that just grew as time went on. So that today there's roughly 900,000 plus Cubans in a county population of going on 2.8 million people. The Hispanic majority of Dade County is about 63%, which is the largest county with a 
with an Hispanic majority of any county in the United States. And we have become this international city. Uh, I don't know when the last time I really heard somebody pronounce Miami, Miami. But I can certainly remember in the 70s, and I was living in Tallahassee then when I would come back. My parents lived here and I had very dear friends here. I would hear southern, slight southern accents on the part of Miami's at that time. I heard my mom a lot. I mean, it vanished. I came back in the beginning of the 80s, and I came back to this international city. That was 35 years ago. Nothing compared to what it is today. With the Cuban influx, many other Spanish speakers came from many other parts of the southern hemisphere. And then there was a tremendous Haitian influx beginning, and there were just a few in the 60s, and then a lot by the late 70s. That has continued through today, too. So we have gone from a city that, I think because of location, it's a kind of a window to the Caribbean and the West Indies, was already a city being visited by a lot of uh, interesting people to this great international city of today. And one of the things, before I get into some of these themes I wanted to talk about that are related to the exhibition there is, one of the things I forgot to mention was, if you want to look at folks from somewhere else that were really percentage-wise plentiful in early Miami and were influential, we can't overlook the Bahamian population. The U.S. Census in 1920 indicated that the city of Miami, which only had 29,670 plus people, had the second largest number of West Indian people in the United States, not percentage-wise, numerically, after New York City. And that's because of the Bahamas. Uh, we had a large influx of both white and black Bahamians in the late 19th century in Coconut Grove. We even had a black Bahamian neighborhood in today's Little Havana. It straddled 8th Street between 4th Avenue and about 8th Avenue. And then just west of that, we had a large white Bahamian neighborhood. There's still a, a hill there. It's our, it's our Rocky Mountains. It's about 21 feet above sea level. It's definitely those blue territory. It's called Cotton Hill. It's 11th Avenue, roughly from 8th Street down to St. Peter and Paul and 13th Street. And uh, lots of Bahamians there. So we can't overlook that. Uh,